Hey folks, it's so great to see you all again. Wow, this event has really been something. Um, so many great talks. Tim Medine's talk was just spectacular. I watched the first half of James Lyne's talk in track two and then jumped over to track one to watch the second half of Tim Medine's talk. We've had some really great stuff the entire day. This, let, me, let me tell you how things are gonna flow uh, from here on out. Um, we're gonna do this final panel uh, which will, it's the plenary track, so we're going to have everybody here uh, for this panel. So we're going to do this panel with some practical cyber range tips from experienced builders and users. And then we're going to take like a two or three minute break and we're going to do our closing ceremonies where we're going to do awards for the various CTFs, uh, share a little knowledge and, and, uh, and love, and then, and then we'll finish this whole uh, summit event. But I'd like to introduce to you the panelists here. The idea of this panel was to, to take some folks that have been working on cyber ranges and in cyber ranges, some real thought leaders, and to, uh, to kind of tease out some lessons learned and, and practical tips for you as you're playing in ranges and as you're building your skills, or if you're even building ranges. And we are joined by Major Joshua Rakowski, who is a co-founder and challenge developer of runcode.ninja. Josh is a great friend. Josh and I have gone out for a wonderful meal at Fogo de Cho, uh, and we've enjoyed that. Uh, Josh currently serves as a cyberspace operations officer for the U.S. Army, where he has led a cyber protection team and worked to develop specialized training for those same teams. On his path to cybersecurity, he obtained a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering. Nice. From the United States Military Academy. That's pretty awesome. He's also got a Master's degree in Computer Science from Rice University, focusing on multi-robotic systems. Here's a cool thing too. Josh serves as the executive director and challenge developer for runcode.ninja, which is a programming challenge and capture the flag nonprofit. Pretty, pretty great stuff. And Josh plays a whole bunch of CTFs. He participates in a lot of uh, uh, cyber range competitions. He's, he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We also have Skip Runyon, who's a tech advisor with the US Air Force. Skip is an incredible guy. I met Skip maybe 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, I was, just impressed with him from the very start. He's so insightful. He's a technical advisor and commander senior civilian for the 39th Information Operations Squadron at Hurlburt Field, Florida. That's the United States Air Force's Advanced Information Operations and Cyber Operations Formal Training Unit. So he's from the Air Force Schoolhouse. And he's really a thought leader there. You know, some people talk about the cyber city stuff that we built and they call me the father of cyber city if i'm the father of cyber city skip Runyon is the grandfather of it because he inspired so many ideas that are built into it skip's teams have built and participated in several cyber cyber exercises and ranges including black demon 02 bulwark defender some of you remember those very thought leading at the time the first cyber formal training program uh, he was a contributor to Cyber City. I'll say he was. Mm. And his unit has built and is expanding their initial qualification training range to 90,000 virtual machines. Um, Skip is really incredible. Now, this is not part of his bio, but I'd like to tell you, this is his 40th year with the Air Force. So thank you for your service, sir. We also have Major Joe Marty, a strategic planner with U.S. Cybercom. Major Marty is a strategic defensive cyberspace operations planner at U.S. Cyber Command with five years of tactical and operational experience. I tell you, Major Marty has headed up some blue teams that my teams have engaged with, and he is a formidable adversary. His team spearheaded the defense of industrial control systems and developed the methodology replicated across services and organizations. He has led two DCO training exercises at the Muscatatuck Urban Training Center. That's where we tangled with him, and his team was pretty awesome. He's done three incident response missions and three proactive DCO missions in various industrial control system environments. He's written articles for Cyber Magazine and even 2600 The Hacker Quarterly. He's got a CISSP, five SAN certifications. The guy's amazing. We also have, speaking of amazing, Dr. David Raymond, who is the director of the Virginia Cyber Range and U.S. Cyber Range. Uh, he's a deputy director of the IT Security Lab in Virginia Tech. I met David uh, years ago when he was a professor up at West Point and uh, we would get together and talk with the cadets about building their careers and uh, helping them with various cyber competitions they were involved in. But then David moved down to Virginia Tech where he serves as a founding director of the Virginia Cyber Range and the U.S. Cyber Range. These are cloud-based platforms used by thousands of students in hundreds of high schools and colleges throughout Virginia and also across the whole country. They provide the infrastructure and the courseware for hands-on cyber education. David is a retired Army officer, and his last assignment was at West Point, just like I mentioned, uh, where he led the Capstone Cybersecurity Program and really helped to build those cadets, 
uh, knowledge and understanding and uh, had tremendous influence on their lives. So, so folks, it's just so good that you're here. Um, are you ready to go with the panel? Yes, sir. Did so. we get, Let's do it. Did we get Skip's uh, AV worked out? Yay. Yeah, so. Thumbs up. Very cool. So I would like mm. to start with Josh Rakowski. So Josh, I mean, I watch you and you participate in so many different CTFs and so many cyber ranges. Um, you win a bunch of them, but you, you do amazingly in all of them. What are some of your favorites that you <coughs> have participated in, um, both uh, military and civilian? And what do they have in common, the ones that you really like and get a lot out of? So that's definitely a, definitely a great question and, and a, a hard one to answer because, you know, CTS for me have been like that, that two pound bag of Halloween candy. You open it up <laughs> thinking, oh, it's going to have one or two pieces and then it's done, you know, two pounds of, of candy are gone. Um, and so there, there, there are really a lot there. So it'd be, it'd be hard for me to nail down exactly one or two and, and probably, <laughs> you know, I may forget a few on the way. So, so really what I wanted to focus on is really just kind of the elements that I found that make them good. And also bad because, you know, you also remember the bad ones, um, which is which is also a learning experience in and of itself. Sure. But so some of the traits that, that make them good, um, first and foremost, challenges that tie back to vulnerabilities that you may see in, in, in actual networks, right? So it's, it's not a contrived um, challenge. And so, uh, you know, they, they kind of add that real worldism to the, uh, to the event. Um, also challenge tracks. I'm also a, a big fan of you know, a CTF, a developer that takes the time to walk you into a solution um, by kind of breadcrumbing you um, from point to point to point. Because sometimes if you're just starting out or if you're <clears throat> looking at the problem and you don't quite understand the full scope of the challenge, it's hard to figure out where to start. So I love the challenge tracks where they kind of give you like, hey, take a look at this. And then once you get there, like, hey, why don't you take a look at this again? And then it walks you all the way into exploitation of a particular uh, target or a challenge. Um, and then third, you know, for, for the ones that make them good are, you know, a stable infrastructure. No one likes it when you have flaky infrastructure. So um, CTFs that, that have that um, are definitely top notch in my book. That's now, well some said. of them that make them bad. And again, the learning experience um, therein is if they're bad, then it makes me not want to write challenges like that. Um, so challenges where there's no clear path forward. Also referred to as <laughs> guess the challenge author's thought process, right? You can't even get into their mindset to try to figure out where to start. So that kind of highlights, you know, a bad um, challenge. Um, flaky infrastructure, like I said, to contrast with what I said earlier, you know, you have to try to figure out is, is it my approach that's wrong or is the machine just down when I'm trying to exploit it? Yeah. Um, and then again, I'm, I'm really not a fan of standalone brute force challenges unless it's a, a, a one small step in a multi-step problem. So unfortunately, I didn't quite answer your question, but I wanted to try to highlight um, some of the traits for both good and bad CTFs across, uh, across what I've that, seen. That's really good. I like what you had to say about stability and reliability, as well as concurrency. I'll throw that one in there. That's great. Yeah. I also loved your use of bread coming, bread crumbing as a verb. I'm going to start using that myself now, right? Nice. You got to bread crumb good this water. challenge. There's not enough bread crumbs. Um, <laughs> it's the cowbell of cybersecurity challenges. There's need more cowbell. Um, let's move to Skip next. So thank you, Josh, for that. Really good. Uh, so Skip, uh, you and your team have built mm. some truly astonishing and great mm. ranges. I mean, really incredible stuff over the years for the Air Force Schoolhouse. Um, as a range builder, what do you consider a critical aspect of planning for and building a range for success? Awesome. So, so thank you, uh, Ed. That was, a, that was a great introduction, albeit uh, greatly exaggerated. Uh, I do appreciate it, though, on there. Um, so actually, it goes back to something you taught me in, uh, in 560 many years ago. Uh, start with scope. You can't get too far out of what you want to do. Define what you want to do. You know, uh, Leslie Carhart said uh, um, earlier at the uh, keynote, you know, why are you doing this? Yeah. So let's figure out why you're doing it. Um, Carrie said, talk about scope creep and make sure that you, you bound things. Uh, James, talk about how much is enough. It's a balancing act. Um, You've you got to look at who you're training, how many you're training, and does it look like it's supposed to look like for the user? You know, to give you an idea of how much the, the Air Force now has reinvented itself. Um, in 2008, when we started this, we started off with um, about uh, maybe 10 or 15 virtual machines and a, uh, a, a cast of about, uh, you know, 100 students per year. Hmm. Our requirements have gone up 3,000% hmm. since then on there. Um, we now have the capability to dedicate <laughs> oh, about 200 virtual machines per student, make it look like the Air Force network that they're going to be defending as much as we can. Uh, the, the end state 
because of mm -hmm. where we sit right now, we're, we're what we call initial qualification focused. We're, in, we're focused on the individual skills. We're not initial skills, but we're the next step. Yeah. We're getting the folks ready to operate in a team environment, but we're not operating a team environment yet. Mission qual training, MQT, is next, and that teaches you to be part of the team. And then as a team, you're going to go out and sharpen your skills. You know, Phil Hagen earlier talked about making sure that your team was together and, and working toward that, that goal on there. Uh, how are you and your, and your team, how are you keeping your skills sharp? Um, mission rehearsal, you know, just for the, from an Air Force perspective, uh, uh, U.S. Cybercom, our cyber, AF cyber, we're going to be defending the elections. So can we get to a mission rehearsal that looks like what we're defending? Based on scope, do you have the right hardware and software? Do the storylines fit? Are the scenarios there? Are you keeping maintenance in mind? Do you have your physical and logical updates? Is your environment current? Um, I would say one challenge to folks that are thinking about building a range is do this. Put your business plan together and execute it. Think one year into the future. Everything you did in your business plan works without fail, and you failed. Why? Makes people think. Yeah. Yep. Well, I tell you, there's there's, there's a lot there. Uh, really, really good. So the planning, setting it up up front. What are you trying to achieve with it? Super important. And you know what what we're seeing is that organizations, not just the military, but also organizations like on the earlier panel that we had today, you know, Cisco and Walmart and and various other organizations, are integrating cyber ranges into their overall training process and readiness process for their teams. Uh, I, I think we're, we're on the verge of it being a crucial part of just making sure your people are ready to, to defend their environment. And, exactly and that's going right. to bring us to, to, Joe, to Joe Marty. Um, so Joe, uh, when planning for a red blue cyber exercise on a range, what tips do you have for making realistic scenarios? I know you've pushed us to make the scenarios as realistic as possible. So what do you think? Yeah, that's exactly my first point that I would make for uh, making them realistic is to ensure that you train as you fight. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, one of the questions I asked in one of the previous uh, panels, I think, or, or discussions was um, the question for the PCTE was, is there a way uh, for the teams to be able to connect their deployable kits to the PCTE? Because that's what they're going to be expected to do when they go out for a mission. So um, there needs to be a way for them to connect their kit, even if it's just to make sure they go through the steps because that's what they would do when they go out on a mission. Uh, if, even if it's not actually integrated with the environment, they need to have the accessibility to connect, to go through the steps. Uh, but mainly the scenarios should be designed with the end in mind. What do you want the exercise participants to have accomplished or experienced by the end? Uh, if you want to expose the enterprise focused blue team to an ICS environment, then make sure you have realistic support for the environment. Somebody who's an OT operator who can answer those questions realistically. Um, the typical enterprise IT personnel aren't usually managing ICS networks. If you want an ICS focused team to respond to an enterprise IT network, set up the environment the way that you would really expect them to operate. Um, don't try and change it or, or accommodate to what they're, subject matter expertise is, you know, you want to provide um, as realistic a scenario as possible. Um, most networks have someone responsible for keeping the comms up and that person or those people should be accessible to the team. Um, but for uh, the blue force, your feedback while the exercise is ongoing can shape the scenario to ensure you meet the training objectives. Keep that in mind. And as you're in the process of executing the exercise or the range, your feedback will help shape it and make sure that you get what you want out of this. Remember, it's about your training objectives. And then uh, for the red team, stick to the script. You're a training enabler. You should be pretending to be or emulating the specific threat group or type so that you don't do things that they wouldn't do. Yes, I really like what you had to say about the blue team kind of uh, giving feedback in real time, you know, uh, daily shot validation, hot wash, whatever you want to call it, but in real time to, to, try to push red to make sure that they're keeping uh, reality there as well as focusing on the learning objectives. That's really cool. 